You might not tell, but we are having very lots of technical difficulties this morning. And it's, it's on the week where the sound man and the media lady are on holiday. So, so uh, they're not here at the minute, but I think the way it works is like, we don't really do church membership here, but I think if we do a vote, I think it counts. So, so who thinks they shouldn't go on holiday ever again? Oh yeah, that's the most right. Yeah, we just put that in the minutes, Matt. No holidays for them. Anyway, Steph was right. We are going to show you some message, uh, some pictures of the outside work. If you haven't already been downstairs to get a coffee, um, it's just I was going to do them now. So we have started digging. We're the diggery digger. And so this it looks a mess at the minute, doesn't it? <laughs> it's nearly finished. <laughs> and so, yeah, this is our little patio area here. That's going to be, it looks tiny like a path there at the minute. And here's a little hub, uh, the pod little thing that's going to go in there. Play area here. Next, next slide, I've got two more pictures. I've got to keep an account for this, because like in 10 years' time, I want to look back to see what it looked like. So we're digging all the footings out, all the, all the space to put the, the hardcore, to then put a patio on the top, and to put a, a slab in here. Next slide, please. There it is. That's my, that's my handiwork. That's the only thing I did <laughs> for the five in. So I needed to get a picture of it. <laughs> As evidence, yeah, it may well be in the wrong place. Uh, it's going to cover in the middle of the hub uh, for electricity. And the last one from a different angle. That's it there. So it's a five, by, uh, five meter by five meter thing. But we dug out this space, marked it out, for the log cabin, for the, for the pod that's going to be our youth pod. And the kids will use it as well. I'm sure we'll use it for media stuff as well going forward. But we've got to put a wooden frame in that. Some of you might not have a clue how to do any of this stuff. I do, of course. <laughs> and so, <laughs> it's a bit too loud. Someone smack her on the back of the head. Put a wooden frame in, and we're going to create a, a, a concrete slab to then put the log cabin on out of cement and ballast, you know, water, um, uh, sand and, and gravel and stuff. Mix it all up with water, make a, a nice hard concrete slab for it to go. And I, and I was thinking about this, that it's amazing, really, that in a place where there is no rock, because we'd used to, you know, long time ago, you'd just build on rock rocky stuff, but now we actually, with, through the wonders of technology, we can, we can build where there is no rock because we make our own rock. So we decide we want to build something there, so we'll put some rock there, we'll put a concrete slab there that we can build and we make our own rock. And, and honestly, if we want the pod to last, which we do, we want it to last ages, we want it to last longer than the, than the warranty on it, if, if possible, but if we want it to last, we must build it on something rock solid and that is my title today is rock solid i want to talk about that if you know it was a great example while i was out there if we want that thing to last we've got to build on something rock solid and when we use this term rock solid there's lots of lots of uses of that of that term it's usually meant as a positive thing and then i was thinking about flourish this year and bake off and like rock solid is not a very good Word, same as soggy bottom. If you, if you don't watch Bake Off, that just sounds like I'm being rude. It's not. It's a, if, you, if you don't watch Bake Off, then you need to educate yourself, really. But rock solid. And it, it, I had a flashback, if I'm honest, of um, when we started moving Joel over to changing his diet to see if it can help him in many regards and, and done some gluten free stuff. And um, it's not going where you think, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Filth. And, um, and Steph started trying to, because Steph's great at cakes and stuff. Oh, baking is amazing. I'm trying to get her on Bake Off, but she's like, I can only do cakes. I can't do bread week. So, so practice your bread, and then we'll send you on, on to Bake Off. But she tried to bake these gluten-free, sugar-free, taste-free... Uh, um, <laughs> there's, there's nothing in it. It was just sawdust. But she tried to bake these cookie cakes. Scone cake. I don't know what it was, but it came out and it was rock solid. I mean, it was like, it was rock solid. And I'm like, she's like, because I have to test stuff usually. She doesn't even try it. She's like, Phil, try this. And I was like, babe, I'm not, I don't want to be critical because I know you're a words of affirmation lady. I was like, but food isn't supposed to hurt. <laughs> and I was thinking like, you could, oh, we could leave this in the kitchen, like for if an intruder came in, you could crack them on the head, because the law in England, because we've got some people from the States, you're allowed to defend your home with any, someone looks at your house and you're allowed to sort of just run out and batter them, I think. But in the, in the UK, it's slightly different. And you're not allowed to hit anyone with anything that isn't like naturally where it should be. So you can't keep like a rounders bat or a softball bat or a baseball or anything like in a position that you wouldn't, you'd, on the way to a softball game, you could beat somebody up with it, but you couldn't 
if someone broke into your home, it's reasonable force. So this flashed through my brain as like, I could leave it here. And from a, from a jury's point of view, it's one of my worst cakes. I'll pay for that later. <laughs> and we did, we threw it in the bin. It's not there, don't worry. I've got, I've got other baked goods ready. I've got frozen turkey out every night just in case. But, um, <laughs> but usually, usually rock solid is, is a compliment or considered a good thing in, in most regards. And, you know, you can have a rock solid performance. It can be, it can be faultless. At, at work, you want, especially if you're in a dangerous job, but, but nevertheless, at work, you want a rock solid, like, co-worker don't you you want someone who does what they're supposed to do and is really good and efficient and competent you want them to be rock solid as a friend you want your friend I know we're not always that but you would like to build a friendship that is rock solid that's immovable you want that person not just the friendship but you want them to be rock solid to be stable to be strong so we all like to have rock solid people around us dependable you know people you can trust in but we all want to build for ourselves, I think, as well, a rock-solid life. And so what I really want to zone in on today is that fact, is a rock-solid life. is building a rock-solid life. And, that, and when we think of life, we think of many things. But, you know, I, I'm sure if you're married in here, you want to build a rock-solid marriage. You don't want a, a fully a party, flaky marriage. You want to build a rock-solid marriage. You want to build a, a, a rock-solid work life or career, no matter where you are on that hierarchy. You want it to be rock-solid. You want to be able to test it. You want to be able to trust in it. In your friendships, you want to build that. In relationships in general, in your family, most of us would love and, and almost kill for to have rock-solid relationships with both parents and children in both directions. We'd love the fact we could have that rock-solid relationship. It's something we yearn for, something we'd love to build if possible. Many of you in here would love to have rock-solid finances that nothing could touch. Just rock-solid. It would give you, it'd ease so much of your burdens if you had rock-solid finances. As a, as a community, we want to be rock solid. As a country, as a nation, as security, as a, as a church, we, we look for, we want, we desire at least something that's rock solid. And I was thinking about this, but sometimes it seems even rock solid people are taken out or, or fall over <laughs> or crumble. And it got me thinking, because often from the outside, they, they appear rock solid, but like our log cabin, if we build it, Day one, I'm, a I'm sure it will look rock solid, even if I've got something to do with the building process. <laughs> but I'm sure it will. But over time, something that appears rock solid can, can fall, can crumble. And that can be down to a one-off event, you know, a, a traumatic experience, a thing that, like a tsunami of a, of a thing that comes in and wipes somebody out. Or it can be the trickle and daily worries of life and just these waves battering somebody where they're eroded to the point there's sudden collapse. And so we can see, we, we yearn for solid people, for rock-solid people in our world. We yearn for that for ourselves, but often people fall, people crumble. And so I want to ask ourselves today is, how do we build a rock-solid life? How do we build it? And some of you have probably, you know where I'm going with this, you know, if you've been in church for more than 40 seconds, uh, you can probably guess my bottom line by now, but we've heard of building our life on the rock or... Or as Jesus said, can I have the next uh, the picture? Or not on the sand, at least. Of, of not building a life, a house, our being on, on, on sand that's going to fade away with all the tides and stuff. Because in the Bible, it says that's a stupid art. Like, you, you can think somewhere, where's that story? Is it in Luke, Matthew? I can't remember where it is. That, that, that story about don't do that, that's really stupid. And, and, and it says that it's a silly idea to build on the sand. And we all know this. Even if you're not a builder, if you're someone who doesn't know anything about construction, you know it's a dumb idea. And so the Bible tells us to build our house, our life even, on the rock. And the rock is... Jesus. Easy. Say, <laughs> yay! It wasn't... Like some of you are like, Jesus... Yeah, trick quick, because I sometimes ask trick questions, don't I? It's not a trick question, it's nice and easy. It's Jesus. The rock that we talk about is Jesus. And in Isaiah, it talk, he talks about God being the eternal rock. I love that, that phrase. But, but our society, our, our culture doesn't consider Jesus as the rock. The rock is 
Dwayne Johnson <laughs> the, with the people's elbow. Dwayne Gregory Johnson, it's something like that. I can't recall. Douglas, that's it. Dwayne Douglas Johnson. That doesn't sound like a rock, <laughs> but if you Google the rock, that is what comes up. Is the Dw is Dwayne Johnson as the rock. It's the number one. It's the thing. That's all it is. You Google the rock, that is it. Pages and pages and pictures and pictures of the rock. Dwayne Douglas Johnson. And that just proves that Google is quite often wrong. <laughs> because although he is the rock, he's not the rock. I'd love to see that wrestling match. Jesus to kick his butt. Uh, you got the people's elbow. <laughs> I've got the father's elbow. Kadash. <laughs> but I want you to think about this. But knowing who the rock is, Jesus, not Dwayne, knowing who the rock is, <laughs> is different than building on the rock. Knowing who the rock is and, and building on the rock is a very different thing. And I think sometimes, I've been in church quite a long time now, but I think build the house on the rock or building your life on the rock or building something on the rock in church circles sometimes means if we tag Jesus' name on it, then on anything that we do, then that is building on the rock. Then it's rock solid. We just we keep Jesus in the mix somewhere. We like put him next to us in our language, just say his name when we're doing stuff, and that is building on the rock. And I think so often that is what we do and justify as building on the rock but, <laughs> and, and thinking it's rock solid. But the context of this building on the rock stuff is really clear. It's not just about knowing who Jesus is and that he is the rock. Let's read in Luke 6, 46 to 49. I'm going to read from the NLT version. It's talking about building on a solid foundation. And I love the way, I read this in Matthew and then I, I read it in Luke as well. But I love the way it starts off in, in Luke much better. It says this, so why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? I can imagine the frustration there. You're, you're using the word Lord, Lord, as in you are my master. I will do everything. I serve you. But you're not doing what I'm, I can, I, can, I get that. With four kids, <laughs> put your shoes on. <laughs> He's saying, why do you call me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? And it says this from verse 47. I will show you what it is. Sorry. I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then follows it. <laughs> That's key. It's like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation on solid rock. When the floodwaters rise, and they will, <laughs> And break against that house. It says it stands firm because it was well built. It included the actual building of building on the foundation. Not just the top stuff. The top stuff could be well built. You know, we can put the log cabin together well built. But he says when it's built on that solid rock, that foundation, then it stands firm because it's well be built. Verse 49 goes on to say, but anyone who hears and doesn't obey. They hear it. They see Jesus. They see the rock. They see the rock speaking, a speaking rock. And it says, and that person doesn't obey, doesn't follow his teaching, doesn't do what he asks. That person is like, <laughs> like a person who builds a house right on the ground, and other translation, on the sand, without a foundation. When the floods sweep down against the house, it, Jesus says, it will collapse. It will. It might not this time. It might not next time. But it will collapse into a heap of ruins. And it's a great picture for our life about what we build our life on and around. And I want you to think about this because to build, and I'm no linguist, but to build is a verb. Don't worry, I checked on Google. It's always right, remember. <laughs> I typed in verb and Dwayne the Rock Johnson popped up. <laughs> to build is a verb, it's a doing word, vis-a-vis -vis ergo, building on the rock, is an action, is a doing thing. It's not simply belief, it's not simply an acceptance that Jesus is that thing. It's not just, because some things in the Christian world is just an acceptance and belief of Jesus thing. That's what it is. But what Jesus is talking about here, of building a life on a rock, is not just an acceptance and believing thing of who he is. It's an action, it's a doing thing. And so, knowing Jesus to be the rock is not the same as building your life on the rock. 
And I want to read this from the message version. It's exactly the same scripture, but I just love the language in it. It just phrases it slightly differently and gets us thinking from a different angle. It says this, that from verse 24, I think we are. Is that right? It says this, uh, Ma- uh, Matthew 24, 27, the same story in a different gospel, different translation. It says, these words I speak to you are not incidents, incidental additions to your life. I love that. They're not incidental additions. They're not bolt on things. You don't build your thing and then plug me in like Lego. They're not additions to your life. They're not homeowner improvements. They're not putting a patio on the back. They're not extending. They're not homeowner improvements to your standard of living. Check this. It says they are foundational words. I love this. Words to build a life on. Work. Think about that. Building a life on words. How, that, doesn't, that sounds weird, doesn't it? But you're actually building a life on Jesus' words. They are foundational words, words, words to actually build your life on. And it says this, I love it. If you work these words into your life, work these words into your life, you are like a smart carpenter who built his house on solid, solid rock. Rain poured down, the river flooded, tornado hit, but nothing moved the house. It was fixed, I love this, fixed to the rock. It was fixed to the rock. It was fixed to Jesus. But if you just use my words in, I love the message version, if you just use my words in Bible studies and don't work them into your life, you are like a stupid carpenter, I love it, who built his house on the sandy beach. When a storm rolled in and the waves came up, it collapsed like a house of cards. But if you just use my words in Bible studies uh, and don't work them into your life, the message translation right as a genius. Because believing in a rock is not the same thing as building on a rock. Duh. It's so simple. Believing in a rock is not the same as building on a rock. That's just acknowledging there's a rock. And the rock's great, the rock's deep, but that was all it is, believing in it, accepting it. Even as what Jesus would say, you call me Lord, like Lordy Rock, but you don't do what I say, it's just a rock. You're just acknowledging that it is the rock, that Jesus is that thing to build on. And I want you to think about this. Like We're spending a lot of money and time and effort to build a place that we can build church and, and get new people to come to church and come to know Christ. We build an outside space to help do that. But if we put that pod, that log cabin, if we dig out that slab space and we put a concrete slab in there ready for it to go, and then we built the cabin next to it on the grass, can I tell you, if I'd have done that while Tony was on holiday, he would have come back and he would have slapped me. And he would, because it wouldn't compute. I think he would have a breakdown. Because he would be like, I don't understand. You can see that you even put the slab in. You instructed it. (laughs) And then you chose to build the thing next to the rock (laughs) instead of on the rock. You know the rock. You understood the rock. You even know the ingredients of the rock. You, You ordered the ballast fill. The gravel and the sand and the water and the cement. You paid for it. It's in there. You, I don't, he would go mental. (laughs) And so, if we... Built it on the grass next to it. Have we got, let's put that picture back up. The last one I think I, it was, I had. Like this is where it goes. And this looks quite small, but it is quite a big space. There's a big space exactly the same size next door. If I put it there instead of there, you, every single one of you would think I was nuts, insane, stupid. Just like Jesus' words of a stupid carpenter building on the sand. Because when the rains come, <laughs> and they will, it's England... And the floods will come, and that happens too. We're on a hill. It's going to come this way. It will be. It will fall down. The lock. It would be rock solid for weeks, weeks, maybe months. It would be rock solid. You wouldn't be able to move it. But over time, that erosion would cause it to fall down. And and would any of us be surprised? We wouldn't. It'd be like, yeah, Phil, because you're dumb, because you built it next to the rock. (laughs) But, and I could argue, but. But I understand that is the rock. So why is it falling down? It's like because you haven't built it on the rock, Phil. Yes, but I built it near the rock. Phil, you're not understanding this, mate. You have to build it 
on the concrete slab, on the rock. And I think we can do this, and I'm sort of laboring this point, but I think I'm doing this because we can do this in building our life. We build this thing on top, this magnificent log cabin, lovely colouring, all the floor done, electrics in, I put that pipe in, all that stuff. And yet we can not build on the, on the foundation that was there for us to build on, even though the thing on top looks impressive. And so I did ask earlier, how do we build a rock-solid life? How do we do what Jesus just said? How do, we, how do we do that and work these words into our life or do what I say? Well, the, the whole context of this scripture is that it's, it's like on the end of a sermon. Jesus just preached this whole sermon and we take that little bit that's on the end and we think that's a full story, but it's not. He's saying, do my work, follow what I say, do everything that I've said. This is what you do, build your house on the things that I've just said. And if you can't be bothered to read back two chapters, you won't know what he said. But it's really simple. It's the Sermon on the Mount. He says all these amazing things and then says, and if you build your life on them things, then you're like a a wise builder. And and that stuff will not fall down. And so it's important to understand it's not just Matthew 7, 24 or or Luke, wherever he read. It's, It's Matthew 5, 6 and 7. And he says all these, you can go and read it yourself. I'm just going to touch on some of the the things incorporated in that Sermon on the Mount. But saying things like, let your good deeds shine out for all to see. It says, you've heard it said, don't murder. But I say, if you get angry with someone, you're subject to judgment. And you guys are like, "Um, next next one, don't worry about that one. (laughs) I can get on with the not murder thing. I'm I'm on board with that one. But getting getting angry, I might be, I'm risk at judgment. Move on, Phil. (laughs) It says this, if you call people an idiot, you're in danger. Or raka is in, in the original translation. But if you're basically calling someone an idiot, it says you're in danger. You're, you're on that line of, of judgment. And you're thinking, I haven't done that today yet. <laughs> it says in, in the sermon, if someone has something against you, and you're, and you're given a sacrifice to God in, in the way they did in the temple, it says, leave that sacrifice and go and be reconciled to that person. Someone's got something against you. You've done something wrong, perhaps, or they think you've done something wrong. Jesus said, you, you stop what you're doing, and you go and sort it out. You go and be reconciled, you first. That's what Jesus said. They're some of Jesus' words for us to build our life on. He said that, <laughs> do I go here? If you look at a woman with lust... You've already committed adultery with her in your heart. And somebody like, next, Phil. <laughs> it says, don't make any vows. Just, let, just be simple. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. It's like, just be a person of your word. When you say yes, it means yes. When you say no, it means no. <laughs> he says, if you're attacked by people, to turn the other cheek. And gives lots of examples of how we might do that. He says to go the extra mile. That means going beyond what is expected and required of you in any given social situation. It says don't turn away from those who want to borrow. And some of you are like, I can get on board with that. As long as they bring back my wheelbarrow, I'll lend anything to anyone. <laughs> he then goes on to say, love your enemies. And that was where some people are like, I'm not sure I can get on board with this sort of stuff. But love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And we might think, Jesus, you're just getting silly now. This is just becoming ridiculous. But it wasn't. The crowd was drawn in. It said, in fact, at the end, they were amazed at what he spoke and and applauding. It was like, this is crazy teaching you're speaking to us. But it is all true and it resonated. It said, it also says, don't do your public, uh, don't do your good deeds publicly. Not, not, don't ever do anything good that other people might see. But he says, don't do your public um, deeds, uh, your good deeds publicly so you can be admired by other people. Don't do stuff out there that's good so with that motive of being admired by other people. And some of you are like, well, what's Instagram for then? What's the point? I might as well delete that app. <laughs> he says, you must forgive others. Or you're in danger of not being forgiven for the things you do. Forgive others. He says, don't judge other people or you too will be judged. And that's in a way, and we've talked about judgment in the past in in church, about how we judge rightly in church and what that looks like. Because he also tells us to be careful of false prophets and making judgments about things. And so it's a bit grayer 
than a, a, a throwaway comment like that. But it says, don't store up treasures here on earth. You can't serve God and money. And some of you might be like, oh, come on. <laughs> but it says, don't worry about everyday life. But seek first the kingdom above all else. And the golden rule, the, the big one, the topper, it says, do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. And he says, in, this is the essence that is that's taught in the law and all the prophets and all everything, that's what it comes down to. And, so, and there is more. I haven't, I haven't obviously gone through the whole of this Sermon on the Mount. But all of these things that Jesus said, these are my words that I'm teaching to you now. There, them things, specifically them words, are what I want you to build your life on. And when you do that, then when those, the winds come and the, the floods come, then you will stand firm. So this is building on the rock. This isn't just attaching Jesus' name as the rock on the things that you do. Not just an extension you build on the side. But actually building your life, entwining your life. Working these words into your life. This is what building on the rock is. Taking the words of Christ. Given on that mountain. Given on that rock. That rock speaking on that rock. Taking everything he said. And fortifying it into your life. And laying them as, as the foundation of all the decisions that you make. It's like these, this is the foundation of how I make all my decisions. And so that everything built on top of it is rock solid. And as believers in, in Christ, and if you're not, that's cool. You can take, it, take this or leave this. But as a, a believer in Christ, as a, <laughs> in the rock when we follow our own commands, when we, when we follow our own teaching, our, our own desires and leanings, our natural proclivities to things, when we, when we make our decisions based on them things, we're essentially building our log cabin next to the concrete pad. That's what we're doing. When we, we take Jesus' word as some sort of nice fluffy stuff that we like to read and makes us feel good, and we, and we base all our decision-making processes on our desires and what we want to do and our feelings and our proclivities, we are building a log cabin right next to the concrete pad. Because you understand, if you're a follower of Christ, if you read them words, if you understand them words, you, you can see the rock and you understand the rock. You know what the slab is for. And yet we can choose to build right next to it on unstable sand that comes from our own flesh. And I love the way in Peter put it in 1 Peter. He used a cool picture of, of Jesus being the cornerstone. You know, you probably heard the song, and if you know your Bible, of, of being a living cornerstone of God's temple. That Christ, Jesus Christ, is the cornerstone. And, and, and in building terms, once that cornerstone is set, it's the basis for determining every other measurement and, and direction and things of what is going to be built from it. So they spend a long time, fight, like with, the, with this, we get for planning permission regulations and all that sort of stuff, we have to put the corner in an exact place. So it has to be exact. And then everything else comes off of that. And Peter gave us this picture of Christ being like that living cornerstone. It's the first thing that goes in that, that sets the direction, both the angles of where it's going and where it's going to end up. Every other measurement comes from that. Everything is aligned to it. And as the cornerstone of the building of, of the church, Jesus is the, our standard of measure, our alignment of how we should build. And so earlier I asked the question, how do we build a rock-solid life but i think we need to back up from that before that we have to understand or ascertain well, what is a rock solid life how how do we build it and and what is a rock solid life because i think a rock solid life to you know in the way our culture thinks is very different than maybe what jesus meant and for me maybe not for you but for me a rock solid life doesn't mean everything goes well it doesn't mean that everything that's built on top is pretty and ornate and, and house full of bells and whistles with a picket fence and a perfect family. It's not everything that's built is, is fantastically perfect looking on the top. It's that what it means is when you go through hell on earth, you're still standing. That's what it means for me. When you build a rock solid life, it means when everything's thrown at you, you're still standing firm.
Because I don't think Jesus gives a monkeys about a lot of the peripheral side salad that we think is a rock-solid, important life in our culture. He probably couldn't give a monkeys. It's like, none of that matters. And some of that stuff can be washed away, and I'm quite happy about it. But when you go through hell on earth and you're still standing, that for me is a rock-solid life. When you're still standing firm in and on Christ, then maybe you're stood alone, but you're standing. And there's a great picture I found that just sort of exemplifies this beautifully. <laughs> that little house on that rock, that, little ho- that house does not look like a very fantastic, nice holiday home, you know, unless you want to paddle to get out to it or swim. But... As a house, as a, as a construction, as something that's built, you might think, eh. but it's right, it's on the rock. It's rock solid. Every, everything else around it that was built has been wiped away. All, then, all the neighbors, all the other people on Instagram and Facebook and in church and all your co-workers and everything, all this amazing life that they've built has been wiped away by the tide. And yet this <laughs> humble thing that's been built, but built on the rock is standing firm. Because this, for me, this rock-solid life that I talk about is not just centered on this life, but the next. And I don't want to just build a rock-solid life in this temporal place, although I'd love that. I talked about with marriages, friendships, the church, relationships, all that sort of stuff I think is entwined and part of that. But it's not just that. I don't want to just build rock-solid life in the temporal. I want to build something rock-solid in the eternal. Something rock solid that survives the fire of judgment. I love the way Paul put this in 1 Corinthians 3. We read from 10 to 15. It says this. Because of God's grace to me, it says I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. And that isn't Paul saying, I'm the foundation. Look at me. I'm so wonderful. Because he goes on to say, now others are building on top of it. He's talking about building the church, building the kingdom of God. It says, but whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we, we already have, which is Jesus Christ. So Paul was right into the Corinthian church saying, this is your foundation. He's not saying, I am that foundation. He's saying, as a worker in, in building the kingdom and building local church, we have set you the foundation of Jesus and his words to build on. And everyone needs to be careful what they build on top of that, not just if they build on top of that, but also what they build on top of that. Verse 12, it says this, anyone who builds on that foundation, which Paul is saying is a good thing. You should build on the foundation that is Christ. Build on that rock. But he says anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials. So Paul's saying you can use the, the, the way that we build our lives individually might look incredibly different. Uh, the way a different church builds the kingdom, builds their life, might look incredibly different. It says you can use materials like gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But it says this, but on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work, I love this, has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if that work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. It says, but the builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through the walls of flames. And so this, I want to be clear, this is not about salvation by works. This isn't what this is talking about, but it's about building something rock solid that survives into eternity. Because rock solid is great in this life, we want to build that, but rock solid into eternity. Because we will not so much be judged according to what we do, but according to what we were called to do. I remember a a preacher saying that once, I think it was one of the, the Heaven series or something. But not being judged simply simply, because this is a complicated topic, by, by just what we do, but what God has called us to do. But it will always be on the foundation of Jesus Christ, whatever that is that we build. And, and for me, there's nothing more solid than that. And so I want to build on solid rock. So, so what I build survives in my personal life and what we do as a church and in my marriage and my kids and, and in this kingdom on earth in general, but also in eternity. I want to build something that's rock solid. And so, I think if you want a rock solid life, we need to build on solid rock. And that is on the teachings and words of Jesus.
Not simply belief in him. Not simply acknowledging that he is the rock. But building on that rock to his specs. (laughs) Then Jesus calls us wise builders. And what we build will be rock solid. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for...